Okie dokie. Um, hello, guys. Welcome back to Staying Connected. Obviously, um, every Friday we have somebody from an organization with us. So today um, we are joined by Ian from University of Sunderland. And usually, mate, um, on a Friday, what I'll do is I'll get the guests to kind of introduce themselves. So if you would just kind of tell us just a little bit about what you do and, and just who you are. Yeah, cool. Um, I'm Ian. Um, I'm a senior lecturer in um, film production at the University of Sunderland. Um, I've worked at the university for a number of years. Um, it's all kind of born out of a passion for films and filmmaking. So as, as an academic team at the university, we try to get all of our passions across in this area to, to all of our students. Um, trying to get them to make fantastic documentaries, um, great short films. You know, you know, get and give them some great experience with camera, uh, lighting, editing, sound recording, and teach them how to direct, how to produce. So yeah, it's kind of that's kind of what I do. I try to get my passions across to them, and that's, that's awesome. Man. Yeah. That's really cool. Um, so how how did you get into it? Obviously, I know that's like a bit of like um like a, a way back question, but how how kind of what got you started on that? Was it something you always wanted to do, or did you kind of fall into media or? Um, I think I was just I was just always in the, in the in the films as a kid. I was so cool, that, it was pretty sad, really. I was just a total <laughs> film nerd. Dude, it's like um, me. I'm, I was I'm just, like that now, though. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, this I mean, I was I was don't tell you on, but I was born in 1975. So wow. <laughs> when I was like eight, nine, ten years old, I used to record all these films off TV, go and record like things like American Wealth in London. Nice. Um, um, Alien, um, you know, but um, you know, really quite like extreme films in some respects um yeah, and also yeah, yeah. like stand by me and you know oh, and, and classic. many films as well but i just had always had this like total love of cinema and then obviously when you when you get a bit older and you get your sort of teenagers and you've been asked at school what do you want to do when you grow up i was thinking well though i'm kind of into films mm -hmm. and kind of music a bit i like a bit of sport um what, what the heck do i do with all of that um so yeah that's kind of that, that was that was the sort of first thing I wanted to do really. I wanted to kind of get into into films and and, and, and kind of make and stuff as well. Um, and that kind of led us into um, I started script writing um, in my late oh, teens, well, um, and I wrote a few shorts and I wrote, I wrote a few feature films. But you um, wrote some features, man! Wow. Yeah, you know, well, that was that was the thing when I'm probably yeah was I like twenty one, twenty two, and yeah. I was just. And, you know, even though there were, you know, I've, I've read, some, well, I've looked at some of them back, I haven't read them all back, but I've looked at so many, yeah, some of them are really bad. It's like, oh, God, really bad. Um, <laughs> oh, my, I, 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 yeah. honestly, mate, like, I, there was this still to this day, like, my first, like, year of college, because, like, way back when I did, like, um, like a BTEC in media, and literally, like, I look at, I think about some of my projects from there. There's this one, right? It's so cringe to even think about it. I I, uh, I did like a, um I don't know why but when I was like I don't know, must have been like eighteen nineteen I was in uh like I had the shortest phase ever where I was into like um British gangster films and, but like even the bad ones and like I, so I made like a mock kind of British gangster film and made like it was so cringy and like every like, time like snatch or lock stock and two smoking barrels or something like that yeah yeah but it was just so bad and I think about like, I still get like hot like. Like like now I'm flashbacks now of like when I think about it and I'm like oh that's so cringy that I yeah but you know that's that, that's cool though man it's kind of you know it's that thing that yeah if, if you're into something then just go for it and yeah. even if you know, when I was writing the first few scripts they they were just bad actually and it was you know and people who were you know in other things as well the first few attempts if you're gonna pick up a guitar and mm -hmm. and try and strum you're gonna be terrible but you've got to like just just work on it and, and, and get get and get as, as good as you can really um and I'm when I was in the early twenties I kind of I see. I sold a script. I kind of, I did sell a script. Uh, one was optioned by um, a, a northern, a northeast production company. Wow! Um, oh my kinda, god, man! It, it was, it was never made, and they paid me a pound. Um, but I was sent a contract, and and it was on their books for, for a couple of years. Um, and that kind of thought, well, actually, yeah, I kind of like this. It was That's just because it'd been acknowledged deal, by man. somebody. Um, and then I kind of I did a I did an MA in media production at Tunis University, yeah. And that's kind of when I got a lot more into like different sorts of tech, such as like cameras, um, editing. Um, but it, yeah, again, the whole thing was just totally fueled by just a real love of, of watching movies and really good high end TV. That's kind of that's, that, that, that's really interesting as well because obviously like I when uh like I went I was at Sunderland Uni for a bit and I, I did my third year there and like. When I, like I I wasn't in your class because your class was moving camera at the time, but I I knew that um 
I saw you was like obviously didn't really know you, but I saw you as more of like a like a tech guy with a moving camera and stuff. So I didn't know you had that uh, backup yeah. in writing scripts and you had a script option, which you know for anybody watching that's really hard to do, you know, to get your script option for someone to pick it up because the amount of people that write scripts, like, you know, it, it, and then the amount that get picked up or, or optioned even, it's so, yeah. so small, that number. So that's absolutely yeah, it's, awesome. It's really, everyone just knows Ian, Ian who's into tech, Ian who's into yeah. cam lights. I mean, the, as you say, the, the main area I teach is Steadicam. Yeah, yeah. So, but um, but that, that came a, a bit later on, actually, and I just kind of, I kind of wasn't expecting to get to, to really focus on that area or become experienced in that area but it just sort of happened um and when i started playing with cameras a bit and you know composing shots and i just thought well yeah this is this is kind of cool um i think the issue with that is when, when, you, when you're younger and especially when i was younger in, in the in the 80s yeah um filmmaking kit was just so expensive so if oh you wanted my a, goodness. a camera like i think editing facilities were like you know even you know, when I was like 20, 25, you know, your editing facilities were like ten, thousands and thousands of pounds and no one could really afford them. Wow. It's so strange by today's standards where you can just you can pick up editing software for free, really. Um, and, and cameras, you know, everyone's got their old, you know, f- phone cam. It's, it's, it's all there. It's, you know, but, it, but at the time in the, in, in the 80s, it was pretty much impossible. So when you, when you say to people, oh, yeah, man, I want to get into films. I'm into, you know, Cool, cool directors yeah, and yeah, stuff yeah. And I'm like, really well how are you going to actually do that and you're like oh well I'm not quite sure about that one um but you just you just keep, keep the passion alive and just kind of see where it takes you i think and i think what is important as well is getting in with um people who you're who you're friendly with who have got similar sort of interests so, I think, true. so you're not yeah. you're not like isolated with your passions you know yeah. um, getting to know people which is why university is so great getting to know people who've got some interest as you yeah really just yeah, sort of yeah. like few years in the right direction as well and helps you advance your skills and understand yeah. like dude like that's the thing what i thought about the uni because there's always that thing like um you know that a lot of directors say like oh you know like someone like robert rodriguez they're like you don't need film school you can go over and you can do it yourself and make yourself and it's like that is true in a way but like there's literally like from my experience at uni it's like it puts you in a community of people who also mm. want to make films and you're surrounded by people who have an expertise in making films and you have access to thousands and thousands of pounds worth of kit like where are you going to get like 2k re lights are you going to are you going to rent that it's like going to cost yeah. you a bomb you know what i mean so yeah and, and, all, and also as well as having all the classes it puts you in a situation where your assessed work is you've, you've got to make something. So yeah. your assessment, assessment might be you have to make a three or four minute short film. Yeah. So, you, so if you know if, if that work wasn't there and you were just you know if you were at home with or with friends, you might you, you know you wouldn't get around to that or you, or you might get around to it eventually. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's really difficult. But university is we, we basically say you've got fifteen minutes, so you've got fifteen weeks yeah. to make this to make this two or three minute film, and you've just kind of got to do it, and you'll be graded on the end of it. Definitely. So yeah, you have to do, have to do the work as well. It kind of throws you into that situation, and I think you know it's all about even if, like what we said just before. Even if you're writing stuff or making stuff that, that you don't think is that great, it doesn't it doesn't really matter. I think you know as even as if the projects aren't as successful, you just you just pick up bits of knowledge and understanding of the issues that you came across. And next time you do something, you know you like you'll have that experience that you're not going to sort of like fall into that pit again. And you're going to be a bit more refined, and you know your, your camera works maybe is going to be a bit better, or your script's going to be um, a little bit more efficient, and you know, a bit more entertaining. You know what I mean? So sure. you've got to make those projects just to kind of to kind of learn your craft. Definitely, and I feel like as well, like um, something you mentioned, obviously, like uh, th- one of the things that I always thought was difficult about screenwriting as well is there's like a Hemming- Hemingway quote, and he said that like be prepared to always work without applause, and I felt like that was one of the most true things about screenwriting because. When you shoot a film, if you're making a shot, you can show someone the shots the next day and they're like, well, those shots are pretty cool. But good luck getting like someone to read your 120 page script because it's just not going to happen. Oh, so it's, it's like, yeah. it's such a solitary kind of like act. And I think that that's what makes it so intense, man, because you could write a 120 page script and you've got nothing to show for that. Like, you know what I mean? Like there's no, like no one can tell how hard you've worked on that. Oh so yeah. It's, you know, it's, you know I've, I've, I've got files and files. I, I was looking the other day actually it just project after project. Yeah. Some and some are fi- some are finished. A couple of like you know scripts and yeah. Stuff, you know some are finished. I've got a there's, there's a, a few that are at almost completion, which still need work. And I've just got a whole raft of just like ideas that are like it's maybe it's a first draft or maybe it's a treatment. Yeah. And I think oh my god, I need how am I going to you know and stuff that I've like forgotten about like stuff that I was writing 
15, 20 years ago that I've just completely forgotten about the whole thing. Yeah. Um, but you just have, I think that the, hard, the hardest thing is when it comes to script writing is, yeah, sitting down and doing it because it's a lonely experience. Definitely. Um, and just actually getting something completely nutty finished. So maybe yeah. draft five or maybe draft 10, who knows. But just being, you know, signing off and saying, well, I've finished it. The project is done. I'm now ready to, to move on to my next to the next project. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's hard. It's, I think it's hard finishing stuff with other commitments. And yeah, every, everyone's busy. You know, it's, it's tricky. And, and yeah, exactly. And and also as well, what we were kind of saying there about about uni. When you've got your crew, they're also in, incentivized to work with you because they're going to get graded on their performance as well. And when you're doing it just with your mates, and it's like, all right, you call them up and you're like, oh, we you know we need to go and shoot today, and they'd be like, they could say anything, and there's no like. Quite, like, I don't, for lack of a better word, there's no consequence for that. Like they could just like pull a sickie, and then that's it. You, 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 you're knackered. You know, you don't have a, like a camera up or something. Yeah, but when yeah. you're shooting, you need to do. They need to do it. So it's like they're definitely good. Yeah, and you, yeah, and you have to work with people that, that you trust. And you have to definitely. work with people who want to call in sick on the day. Yeah, so yeah, it's, exactly. It's finding those those friends who have got the same interest and the same levels of, of passion, um, and they're not going to just like you know they're not going to pull out you know at a moment's notice. Definitely. So yeah, I think a lot of it is is finding people like that who you can kind of then communicate with and definitely and, and advance your mm-hmm. and advance your skills in the right direction so yeah. interesting you said as well which is something that i always preach to people is about how accessible film has become right and i mean obviously it's still for me it's became i, I think you touched on something that's really really like such a good point and it's just how different like the landscape of you know guerrilla filmmaking has became so just for mm-hmm. example like literally now it's became the same as playing an instrument right um, it might be a little bit expensive for a guitar or a keyboard, but anybody can get that and they can sit and they can play it at home. And it's the same with making videos now. Mm. Everyone's got a smartphone. You can get, right, because like the other day, um, I, I edited one of a video, Mel did it. it, was like an arts and crafts video making a sunflower and we did like a double camera setup and we shot on, um, I think it was like Dan's newest iPhone, so the newest iPhone. And then we shot on um, a DSLR as well. And uh, literally the intercut, you can barely tell the difference. And it's like, insane now that that is like intercutting from a phone to a camera and everyone i've shown like no one's said like oh that's a phone and that's a camera because you can't tell and yeah, it's yeah. unbelievable mate that that's like where it's became now so it's like literally if yeah. you want to start doing guerrilla filmmaking you could do that um yeah. and you, you could yeah. you know just get your phone out buy you know um like some some clip-on mics or just buy like a i'm sure you could get like an adapter for like an onboard mic for for yeah. a, um for an iphone you could definitely yeah. do that and you can just go and start shooting and I did a full um, five lessons, um, which are all up on YouTube, of, um, you know, video editing class. And it was on a free software, HitFilm Express. And it's like, it's, you know, they built their um, interface, like, based off uh, Premiere Pro. So it's like, it's the same kind of, you know, um, it's the same kind of interface as Premiere Pro. So, yeah, it's never been easier. But casting back to, like, the 80s or, or 90s, it's like when people, you know, it was hard to get a digital camera unless it was, like, a crap, like, um one of those like DVR things that um, like Lynch yeah, shot yeah, yeah. in Inland Empire on, like it was yeah. like one of those like big huge ones, but it, but like like and also, it, um, I, I guess the question is, is it <clears throat> is it is it too easy now? Is it maybe like, right? I don't mean easy as it is it easy to make stuff. <clears throat> I mean, is the camera, is the editing software, is it just is it so accessible? Yeah, that people, because there's no there's no struggle there really. It's just there, and it's maybe it's a bit too easy. So maybe that is maybe it's gone a little bit too far. Yeah, maybe yeah, yeah. Things are just so accessible now, and then really, you know, and, and learning tech is <clears throat> it's important to learning yeah. about you know, exposure and, and good sound recording and, and all that stuff is is it's vital, really. But you know, this, this is what we say to all the students at the university: you've got to nail your story, man. You know, and if you know your, your, your film might look fantastic, it might sound fantastic, but if we don't care about the characters, if we don't care about you know what's happening in, in the story, then story, the story, story. Work. So it's you know some things still remain the same, even though technology's moved on. Yeah, story is still absolutely vital in having how you're making the audience feel. Is the audience connected or are they disconnected? And yeah. if they're disconnected, something ain't working. You know, it's a problem. Man, yeah, I, I like uh, I always really struggle as well with. Um... You know, I, I know people who go for like a kind of avant-garde approach and it's like, it, it kind of pains me a bit when, you know, people throw out the excuse of like, this is art, 
to like an extreme degree like you, that's fine you know you can make an avant-garde film but if it's like say if, if you're starting to use that for the justification of having completely no no kind of narrative at all like yeah. it, then it's, it starts to become an issue because it just looks like a, a sequence of, of scenes um yeah 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 i mean i, th- I think you know some, some, sometimes those avant-garde more abstract films do do, do actually work because they, 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 they do work because it's more about like giving the audience a feeling mm-hmm. um but yeah but some of them some of them don't and it's you know and, and you're and you're not as connected but i, I quite like films that are you know, push the boundaries of that a little bit because i think when yeah. films are successful and they do that mm-hmm. um, it kind of you know you, you find it even more engaging this it's a bit quirky, it's a bit different, and you know, and I'm getting a different viewpoint on these characters or how, how to even make a film. Well, yeah. well, it's, it's well, I think as well, in like, uh, you know, there's an expression I used the other day, and, it, and it's like, uh, I can't remember who said it, but it, it's it's a famous quote, and it's like, learn the rules so you know how to break them properly. So yeah. it's like, and it's like that kind of thing. Like, if you look at something like a, a Lars von Trier film or something, when he breaks the 180 degree rule, he's aware that he's doing it, and he's doing it for mm-hmm. a purpose. Um, whereas, like, someone who's doing it kind of just trying to throw stuff at the wall and see what sticks so mm-hmm. it's like in the same way like someone like lynch you know what i mean like he yeah. will use those kind of techniques consciously because he knows it's going to create like a a kind of atmospheric yeah. feeling where you're going to feel uncomfortable that there's like no negative space yeah. or, or there's yeah. loads of negative space for some reason yeah, so you do, yeah, yeah yeah you have to you have to you have to you have to learn all of those rules and you've got to you know find all that stuff out and then yeah you're right you know if you and if you break them you've, you've got to break them for like a reason i yeah, should say right. Yeah, you know, it's, it's it's funny when occasionally when people say, "Yeah, or, you know, I know that's not really you know that, in terms of rule of thirds or headroom or something." Yeah, that that was intentionally, and that's kind of what we meant it to do. And I'm saying, like, "Is that really what you intended to do?" <laughs> no, it's like, like a moment. Oh, headroom, so that's the bottom of the frame. And yeah. The so yeah. intended to do that. Tell me why you intended to do that. Yeah, and it's like, yeah, it's good, man. I mean, I have that issue with kind of like a lot of conceptual art in general, and I guess it's my opinion, obviously. But it's like sometimes when like the justification of something is more detailed than the actual piece itself, and I feel yeah. like you know what I'm saying. Like I've like I've been there, you know, not to go off topic, but I've been to art galleries before, and it's like there's literally been a blank canvas, and then there's mm-hmm. this huge manifesto of why it's important, and I'm like you know art in my opinion like that kind of art should speak for itself and if you haven't explained why it's important then i think that you've already lost the point of it so yeah yeah definitely yeah no it's it's, <laughs> it's, it's interesting stuff but yeah i mean i think it it, it, it's, it all comes from the, the, the fact you know that you just you just if you want to make stuff just just make stuff don't sit for 20 years and say oh i want to be a i want to be a director but you don't actually direct anything so it's just just like do it and it like it doesn't matter to a major degree it doesn't matter if it ain't very good because mm-hmm. you just you just learn it over time you just you just learn it and you you've got to put yourself in that situation you know say like when i went out when i started script writing it's you know like initially i was thinking well this, i've got no idea what to do and and I, didn't, and I didn't do anything for like for years actually and then i just kind of started writing stuff started writing stuff by hand yeah um and just and i think i wrote a scene or a few scenes that you know look, 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 you know if i was looking back now they'd be absolutely terrible but you just kind of do it. You've just got to kind of do it. That's the that's key, I think. Definitely, I totally agree. So I know Ian as well. You've kind of shot some stuff um, with us before. Um, Lisa sent me a picture here of you at Shine with your camera. I don't know if you're watching the stream, so you might not be able to see it. But um, I, Dan and Lisa in the chat have been begging me to to, to put this on. So I've uh, I've got the picture it's of. Gonna be embarrassing. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's just you. It's just you with uh, with uh, Black Magic. I get to ask you. Camera that's probably bigger than me. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, so yeah, that's a nice, nice shot there of uh, of Ian, um, doing doing some of his work with us. Um, I'll just have a little quick catch up with the chat as well there. That's so, all right. Yeah. Cool. Um, see what see what people have been saying. Um, so let's have a little look. Okay. So, um, here for right. Okay, that's there's so much going on here. All right, so uh, Hafem says the show is going up in the world with Jason Statham. Um, yeah, that, it's, I always find it quite funny when people say that. What, <laughs> what, what people mean when they say that is, Ian, you're bald a bit like Jason Statham. And that's <laughs> you know, essentially, you just call me bald. <laughs> why I always, I always keep a hat on standby. Nice, just in man. Case, there you, you know, go. Yes. That's like, classic. the Beastie Boys and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> the Adrock um so and then ba, ba, ba. sue says that she always gets good ideas for documentary and videos but can't get them down on paper so that's absolutely fine um sue yeah what i'd recommend is 
um yeah just get get them out there and it, like it's like i think as well a lot of people have some great ideas in the mind it's just putting them on paper and what i would do is i'd, I'd make like a note on a notepad i just write a few ideas down and then i just i'd do it gradually when stuff comes to you and just leave some time for brainstorming like literally not a lot of people do that but like just sit and have like 20 30 minutes where you're just going to sit and you're just going to brainstorm and just kind of think about you know like writing down different stuff and see what comes to you um and sometimes as well don't worry if you ever get to a point where you feel like the idea is not going anywhere sometimes you can just put a pin in it work on something else and then come back to that idea as well um is there anything you'd like to add to that at all Peggy? Or? yeah i think you know i think just if you've got ideas in your head and you want to get them down on paper then don't worry about like grammar or spelling and definitely just literally just, just throw it all out there just literally just get it all down on your on your sheet of paper you know with a, with a pen and paper or you know t- t- if you can t- type it all on your on your computer um but i think just if you throw it all down and then you just kind of like just craft it and you perfect it and you fix it and you work at it and you and and, and, it's, and kind of when you're doing that you're almost going like through draft after draft even though it's maybe it's not a script or something like that maybe it's just a treatment that you're drafting but just get it all out there firstly <clears throat> and then just 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 refine it yeah that's what i would do i think if you if you keep stuff in your head sometimes when you come up with an idea like i've got, I've got to write stuff down because if i don't write stuff down straight away when it's there and it's like it's hot and i think that's a good hot idea um <clears throat> i'll forget you know a few weeks later i'll be like what was that idea again I'll I know. Like yeah. um just get it down and just have a have a folder with those all those ideas in and just get them done get them done so um also dan had a good point as well here um like a question relevant to you he said that is there any spe- uh, specific advice from staff about finding the right crew slash team to collab with so i think that's a pretty good one um i suppose you've got to think about where you're going to meet people yeah um so and obviously we've, we've already mentioned this so you, you you know if you're enrolled in a university course or any course really like a filmmaking course you're going to meet people there who've got a similar sort of interest um friends you know if you've got any friends who are in, into this sort of thing um people that you know online you know i just think think of like different groups of people that you know different pools of friends or colleagues um and just kind of put the word of it this is what you're interested in is, is anybody in it? is anybody else interested yeah it's, you know it's, it's difficult you know if you if you want to make something you know in, in terms of film in terms of films anyway um you know you can't really, you can't really do it by yourself you know you, you you have to have a crew of people you have to have actors um and i think you know you just got to express to people that this is what you're interested in this is the sort of thing you want to make and with your your your, your friendship groups the people that you know <clears throat> yeah. um just tell them and then to make come forward and say well actually you know what i'm a really i'm into sound recording you know and I'm, i quite fancy getting involved in that project or yeah. i want to do never acted before but that sounds pretty cool it's what it's a two-minute film i've never acted before but surely i can be in a two-minute film not be a good experience i think just take the thought take take the passion from inside and just put it out there whether it's online verbally with people that you know you know as you enroll in courses anything like that just just get it out just get it out yeah i i think that's that's solid advice and it's yeah it's just kind of putting putting the word out there and kind of seeing what um come mm-hmm. back and like as you said it's like getting yourself into kind of a, co- a community where you've got people who've got similar interests and they're going to kind of be motivated um to, yeah. to do similar stuff as well um yeah. so, so, yeah. don't, don't, don't be shy with it you know yeah. don't be don't be like um like embarrassed or i want to be a i want to be a script writer um what must i tell somebody if, and if they laugh yeah you know? well, like so what like yeah. who cares if they laugh you know you know in, in, in a few years time <clears throat> or a few months time you might have a, a film that, that you know that because you told a few people that you're interested in making a film you've then made a film Definitely. You know, so okay, the first few conversations were embarrassing and somebody laughed at you it doesn't matter 100%. And I think as well, there's a really good um, kind of ex- ex- expression there, which is um, I'd rather be someone who makes something that gets criticized than be someone who doesn't make anything and criticizes others. So I think that yeah, that's, yeah. you know, that's pretty much kind of going off the same um, bit. Yeah, it's, it's the same thing. Yeah. If you want to be a writer, well, you've got to like write stuff, you know, and if you don't, you know, you, you might sit on your ideas for 10, 20, 30 years, but if you don't actually do anything, you're going to be really frustrated at the end of the process and you're gonna you're gonna think back and well actually i kind of wish i did that at, at the time so yeah just just do it exactly as mr, yeah. as mr. nike once said just do it <laughs> <laughs> that's that's uh that's so true man um so yeah anthony there says that he remembers meeting you at shine he says we talked a bit about uh davinci resolve which is another good uh program there it's a good 
free program. So DaVinci Resolve, HitFilm Express, both good video editing, um, free softwares, I think. Um, color grading, color correction, yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's amazing. That, that, um, yeah. That's a three bit of kit, yes, that's just. It's a, it's a fantastic bit of software. Definitely. Um, and uh, yeah, so I wanted to ask, this is a little bit off topic, but like just randomly, like, could, what, what, like, this is a horrible question because like, I, I, I never know how to answer this question when people ask me, but do you have a few favorite films that you want to put out there? Not, I'm not going to say your favorite film because I know that's probably very hard for you to answer, but like yeah, just yeah. a couple of different films that you, that you really like. Um, well, I think certainly the films when, when you're a kid see, kind of stay with you all yeah. the way through. And I've mentioned stuff like The Thing, Aliens, uh, Back to the Future, um, Alien as well, um, Pulp Fiction, um, Spike, you know, a lot of Spike Lee movies. Oh, um, cool, yeah. I, thought, um, I think the, 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 the final film I saw at the cinema before um, all this craziness happened and we couldn't get to sit the cinema anymore or do anything anymore uh, was, um, was Parasite. Um, oh right! On. I was I was really impressed with Parasite. I know it won yeah. like a lot of awards, and often you go and see these films and, and, and uh, they're a bit overhyped. And you think, well, it wasn't actually that good, but I thought Parasite was absolutely fantastic. Yeah, I was really impressed. Definitely. And um, yes, yeah, so just there's, there's lots of stuff really, and I think um, often just try and find out who who the director is, who is the cinematographer, you know, who who, who put that film together. I kind of you know, and what have they done before? <clears throat> that's probably something that started out when I was a kid when I. Was, Probably, I think probably the first director I was really interested in was like Spielberg. I think everybody oh, was he's one of the best ever, you know. Uh, oh, jo- Jaws, unbelievable. Yeah, yeah uh, Jaws, Close Encounters. I think I saw Temple of Doom. It was, it was yeah. the Christmas film one year <clears throat> in about 85, 86. I remember watching it and uh, I recorded it on VHS. And um, and it's like, oh, wow, Spielberg, I remember that. Yeah. And obviously, as you say, Jaws and Jew yeah. and Close Encounters. Unreal. And, uh, yeah, so I just, yeah, getting into sort of people who are totally into the craft and totally into the area Definitely. and exploring what, what, what they've done. Even if, I think I did something with like um, Hitchcock as well, you know, so awesome, yeah. Hitchcock's, you know, an absolute um, filmmaker from, you know, he's made so many, he made so many films and probably the most famous British um, yeah. filmmaker of all time. So influential he's as well. Finding the box set and watching Vertigo and, and Psycho and, and honestly, and, he, and, and the guy never won an Oscar. That's insane to think back to that. Yeah, and I mean, I, I really love the um, Hitchcocks with, with uh, Cary Grant. I was a big fan of Cary Grant. He was like the original George Clooney. Um, yeah, yeah. And I, yeah, I love North by Northwest. Um, I think it was Notorious as well with Hitchcock. I'm not sure if that was a Hitchcock film, yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's and, and and you know Cary Grant. He worked with Hitchcock. I think about three or four films. And yeah, just just fantastic. Oh yeah, he did one with Hitchcock, late Hitchcock called To Catch a Thief uh, with oh, Grace, yes. Grace Kelly fantastic mm-hmm. that's a really good one um yeah. there's, there's some good older films out there isn't there oh definitely. my god definitely definitely have you, have, you watched, have you watched psycho recently not for a long time i've never I, like I, psycho is a classic one of the most uh, one of the original um horror movies and uh yeah. great movie I but think, i haven't seen it in a long time i think um i mean i, I watched that it was a couple of years ago i watched it back and uh, i think it was released in 1960 and it's so different and so edgy. You know, I think, you know, you kind of think of, you know, Psycho, it's famous, there were sequels, there's been TV shows and everything, and it's, there's been loads of stuff written about it over the years. If you just go back and watch Psycho, you, th- you know, as, as a mainstream, you know, very commercial film, it's doing some pretty awesome stuff that's, ver- that's, that's very different to other yeah. films at the time and, and, other, and, and films now. It's really sort of pushing the boundaries of filmmaking. Well, one of the things as well with Psycho at the time was uh, it was quite violent. You know, the blood going down into the sink and like even that was quite like, a, you know, it was a bit risque at the time to do something like that. Um, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, that, you know that, 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 that scene, right? You know, you said blood going down the drain, mm-hmm. which is meant to be one of the most shocking sort of violent scenes in cinema history. You know what it is? What's it's, an example, it's an example of awesome editing. Yeah. Because you, you do not see anything, man. You, see, you don't see any... And he, like now, now if they're going to make it, you'd see cuts, you'd see blood everywhere. Yeah, and it, you don't any of that. You do, you just see a great, a great, a great edited sequence. That's what it's. Yeah, another good Hitchcock code, which I'm going to butcher because I actually forgot it as I'm speaking. But it, like roughly along the lines of it was that you know it's not about like the bang, it's the lead up to the bang. I've totally butchered that quote. It's much much more eloquent yeah. than that. <laughs> but but uh, you, you get the gist though, right? And he's the master of suspense and. So basically, it's the whole thing in horror films where, like, you don't show the monster, right? Like, when you show the monster, the illusion's over, yeah, and it's yeah. kind of, it's about building suspense and kind of, um, yeah, it's, you don't have to 
show something like right on in order to kind of create an impression which, which, which is why jaws was jaws is oh, such a classic exactly, exactly. Because, exactly. You know, they, they, they had the shark that wouldn't work mm -hmm. spielberg had to kind of film around this the shark that, that wasn't there um and because you don't really see it you know that's what <clears throat> ramps up the tension so much yeah um, and then when you do eventually see the shark and i know we kind of forgive it now because it's a classic film but it looks like a rubber shark. The rubber shark was all the way through it. The film probably wouldn't work quite well. I think as well. We had an amazing editor as well. Yeah. You know, it's it's a, it's I mean, an absolute yeah. masterclass in suspense, isn't it? I mean, yeah. And the guy, like my, the, the scene from Jaws that sticks in my head all the time is just like, oh, the Chief Brody. I forget the actor's name, but his performance is fantastic. Roy, Roy Scheider. Yeah, Roy Scheider. He's unbelievable in Marathon Man. He's in a, quite a few films where he's just so good. Yeah. And um, the the scene on the beach when it's the one at there's this the Spielberg one is like a, a very typical Spielberg um, camera thing he does where he'll, he'll shoot something in one take and it, and he uses screen wipes wipes to like get closer each time. You oh, know, you know yeah. what talking about? We sat on the beach and he knows that it's dangerous and they keep wiping and people walk across the screen and then it gets closer and closer to do. Yeah, that bit is just so good. Um, it's, it's, it's where the it's where the little kitten boy gets killed, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah, he's, yeah. On, he's on his, his airbed. His yellow air bed. It, yeah. Um, yeah, it kind of it kind of builds up to that. Yeah. It's so unreal. That's, that's such a classic. Um, yeah. Such a classic scene, isn't it? Fantastic. Um, but he, he, had, he had a great editor. It's called Werner Fields. And um the, the, uh, and, and nickname in Hollywood was the, the Mother Cutter. That was like <laughs> all, the, all the Hollywood brats, like Lucas and Scorsese and Spielberg, they called Werner Fields the Mother Cutter because she was just she would just hack away at stuff. And she was an amazing editor. And, and, and it's one of the big reasons why Jaws is so successful because Werner Fields' editing was absolutely fantastic. And she made something out of this footage where there was no shot. I know. So, and and I really think as well um, that, you know, editors don't get enough kind of, they, they don't get enough um, credit because it's, you always think about, you know, oh, the direct, who's the director, who's the um Ed, like who's the who's the uh actor but then the yeah. editor's like kind of in the back and it's the same with the writer as well like sometimes the writer doesn't get enough enough uh um yeah credit. yeah i always feel a bit sorry for the for the, for the person who wrote the script because they can't they kind of get forgotten about a little bit don't they yeah, yeah i have to i have to mention the birds because we're getting some uh stick for, for not talking about it uh so yeah so here from says we didn't mention the birds sue says it's so scary and tense and um dan says he loves it and he also follows up to say that the ride is usually at least partially um, down by the payoff, especially in the horror thriller genre. Uh, genre. And then he says, that, and then Hafem says, there's no terror in the bank, only in the anticipation of it, which is the quote that I butchered. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's such a great film, The Birds. It is, because there's, there's really not, there's not yeah. loads going on plot-wise. Um, but again, Hitchcock just ramps up this tension in the, in, in, in the village, in the it, town. Yeah. The birds going to attack. It's um, yeah, it's, it's 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 such a good yeah, it's such a good again another exercise in just racking up tension Definitely. with minimal plot and minimal dialogue. Really, there's not loads going on. Yeah, and I mean, come on, it's like it's 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 like the perfect example of what we're talking about. I mean, like there's something as mundane is like a bunch of birds, like that is yeah. like not terrifying at all. But yeah. he makes it so terrifying and so tense, and it's like it's just yeah. what we're talking about. You know, you don't actually need. To have some kind of huge, like monster kind of thing to, yeah. to be able. If, to if, if you heard, there's, a, there's a really bad sequel to the birds, which I've never seen. No, I think it's called like the birds two. It's called like Land's End oh, or something man. like that. It's from like ninety four, ninety five. Oh. Uh, I've, I've never seen it. I've never seen it at all. But I <laughs> guess it's a, it's a one star film. Like you just you just can't you can't make a sequel to the birds. Can no, I I think as well, some of that we were talking about, you know, just how. Um, that was like such like a you know the people talk about how horrifying the um that that scene is when the blood kind of runs into the sink and, and I, I was thinking as well it kind of just put me on a thought about how much stick that tarantino started to get in the 90s about violence but then if you yeah. think, cast your mind back as well in the 80s like brian de palma was doing such violent films if you look at scarface like oh, that's wow. like super violent compared yeah, there's, um, there's many scenes in Scarface with, this, with the chainsaws oh where the guys man. are getting like, cut in half. Yeah, it's um, crazy. Yeah, I think it's, it was written by Oliver Stone, wasn't it? Scarface. Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, it's like it's uber violent. I isn't know. It? Um, yeah, but, but yeah, it, I think you know, I think you know, filmmakers do always get into to trouble with you know with the censors and there's something too violent or not. 
Um, but, but now, you know, you think Scarface is like an absolute, you know, 1983. Yeah. Totally violent. Another absolute classic. It's oh, totally. totally. Brian De Palma, he's, he's definitely up there with one of my favourites. He's like um, a real kind of genius, I think, as well. And he did, yeah. um, I think it's uh, Antonioni. There's a film called Blow Up, which is the the, the one where he's a photographer. And it's, De Palma did a remake. It's Blow Travolta, up. isn't it? It's, it's so good. good. Yeah, it's <clears throat> Travolta, and he's a he's a sound designer, and he hit. And so in in the original, uh, the Italian film, he he, he, he photographs a murder, and then they they come after him. Uh, he's like a, he's like a normal guy, and then in the um, the Palma remake, he's a sound designer, and he hears a murder, and then that's the thing. Yeah. So in it, but it's such a good movie, and it's one of his yeah. kind of underrated movies. I think. Um, yeah, I think it's at like eighty two, eighty three, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, I think um, it is. Yeah. yeah, I think it's. I think you know. Again, Brian De Palma's films, he's like a, he's like a more of a, <clears throat> he's like a modern day Hitchcock, wasn't he? Oh, totally. Making yeah. stuff that was probably a bit more violent. And Definitely. Pushed the boundaries a bit more, but he was totally inspired by Hitchcock and, you know, building suspense. Yeah, oh, totally. Um, yeah, he's got, you know, he's got, Brian De Palma's got some fantastic films. We look, oh. look at the first Mission Impossible. Yeah. Well, well, yeah, I didn't even think of... style, isn't it? His, yeah, yeah. Completely his style. Even and then when you watched Mission Impossible 2, you were like, oh man, John Woo didn't do I quite know. as good job as it was Brian De Palma. You know? Yeah, and it's, it's a shame because I'm like a big John Woo fan, but I feel like his Western films never... It's always the case, though, because like when Asian directors work on Western films, th- there's, there's a thing, and especially if they're from that like Hong Kong school, like um, I read Jackie Chan's autobiography lately, and he was saying that they would do like 2,000 takes like in a day on an yeah. action scene, and like literally like... When in in Hong Kong, especially with like a studio like Golden Harvest, they had like a license to to print money, and they just give mm-hmm. them time. Like Raymond Chow said to um, Jackie Chan, he was like, "Just go and film what you want," and they would mm-hmm. do it. But when those directors go over to Hollywood, like uh, Wong Kar Wai did a film called My Blueberry Nights, which is not very mm-hmm. good. Um, yeah. John Woo, obviously, Face Off, Face Off's alright, but some of his like Western films, they're not the best, and it's because Hollywood times money. So you, they, there's, so, there's so many deadlines that they need to get to, and it's just they don't have the same freedom that they did in like Hong Kong. Yeah, and it's just a different sort of aesthetic of making films, isn't it? If you're yeah. going to like Hollywood and it's a big budget, it's a totally different sort of vibe. You know, Definitely. To, you know. But obviously Hollywood just tried to bring the success over to them and, and getting these filmmakers in to make some classic films and make a load of cash. Definitely, to yeah. I, I do quite like Face Off. Think, it's uh, good, yeah. It's just so over-the-top crazy. I know. You know. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, well, it's completely you it's get, so over the top, isn't it? Yeah, well, it, it went through the the, the 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 operation when you get in the faces oh, transplanted. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, and um, I think as well that's what you get when you got when you get Nicolas Cage in, in one of those kind of roles. He, he gets a bad rap, but Nicolas, if you want like an over the top, um, out there performance, you can rely on Nicolas Cage to to deliver that. Yeah, for he's, you, I think he's, so. He's a great actor. He probably just makes too much. He makes too much stuff, really. I heard that he went yeah. bankrupt, so I heard that that's why he was knocking out like all those crazy films. Um, I don't know if it's yeah. true, but yeah. If, if you look at his best films, his best films are, are amazing. Yeah, you know, Wild at Heart. Have you seen Wild at Heart? Wild at Heart's amazing. He won his Oscar for. Is it um, leaving Las Vegas? Oh, that... and that's um, Mike Figgis. I'm sure he's like. Yeah, uh, yeah. Is he? He's from England, isn't he? British director, yes. Yeah, yeah. he is. Like Figgis, he created um, like a re- a weird uh, camera rig actually called the Figgis rig. I think it's called it's called the Fig rig. We, we used fig to. Rig. Have, it's li- it's 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 probably the most one of the most simplest camera stabilizers you'll ever see. Essentially, it's just a circle, it's like a steering wheel. Wow. And then there's a camera platform in the middle. Yeah. But it, it kind of. To a degree, it would. It, it's obviously not like steady cam or glide cam or anything like that, but it would. It would smooth out your movement to a degree. So instead of having the handheld bounce like that, yeah, coming kind of of. Over, um, you would have it in this in this device and it would move around. Yeah, we used to have. I think to us, they were like one hundred and fifty pounds. They were they awesome. Were yeah. You could put the microphones onto the rig as well. Yeah, he's. He, he was a bit. Um, I think he made a. He's made a few quite experimental films. Mike Figgis was the one called Time Code. I think yeah, I haven't seen that one. I looked at some of his stuff yeah. and it was like quite like like uh, I've only seen Leaving Las Vegas and I really liked it. But then I looked at his other stuff and I was like, well, if he's made a film that's that acclaimed, he must have a lot more like that. And it's not really. He's got like a couple, a few more films and they seem relatively low budget or or um, yeah. yeah, like you say, they're like quite um, experimental. They're quite out there. Yeah, he's, he's probably a filmmaker to have a look at his back catalogue and just Definitely. check some of those films out. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. Um, yeah, that's that's absolutely awesome. So I wanted to, you know, um, speaking of the figure rig as well, mm-hmm. I, I found that what I really like at the moment is like um, to use a monopod when I'm doing running gun stuff because I think that obviously when you know you need to get some more motion, a tripod's amazing. But if you're just on the move, um, mm-hmm. a monopod's great. And we recently 
upgraded that because we got some. It's sim- it's not really a figure, but like it's like a uh, camera stabilizer. It's like mm-hmm. it's 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 uh, weighted on both sides, and it kind of adjusts to your movement. And oh, yeah. It takes some getting used to, it, but it's actually or it's like quite good. Um, yeah. So so I, I was having a play on that, which we got I recently. Think there's, there's something pretty amazing going on with that uh, with camera stabilization at the moment, where is um you know. 10, 15 years ago, well, even more, you know, you could get a steady cam, and steady cams are fantastic, and that's, that's kind of the main thing that I teach. But now, you know, yeah. you can get really fantastic camera stabilizers. Like the prices are coming down. So now you can just get these fantastic stabilizers for like a few hundred pounds, even cheaper. That are going to give you like a good, it's a, yeah. a good sort of like platform to sort of get your camera moving. So there's not too many footsteps in yeah. shot and just move your shots out. Yeah, the, well, that's what's great about what, what's happening now is that all that tech, that expensive tech. They, you know, they, they managed to find a way of making these devices and other companies that are doing a similar sort of job for a much cheaper price. Definitely. Um, I think again, it goes back to that thing that the kit's there, the software is there, and it's quite cheap if you if you want to make a, a very professional looking film. Hundred percent. Yeah, and I literally think as well. Um, yeah, like if you can get that kit and just kind of looking out there and seeing what's going to be the best. Look at the reviews. If you're going to get something from Amazon, like a um, a camera stabilizer thing look through the reviews google it i always say when people are looking to buy kit it sounds simple but google it and have a look through the reviews look if there's any videos on youtube what if they create like the people who you know there's people who do tech reviews on youtube for all camera stuff so look see who else has bought it what they think um and yeah there's a lot of good stuff out there that's relatively cheap and it can help you and you know if you've got some smooth shots it can really um up the quality of your content quite quite a lot yeah, yeah, yeah. And if, if you think forty years ago, you know, if, if you wanted to, if you wanted to move the camera, the cameras were so heavy in the early seventies and, and, and before then, you know, you any handheld was pretty much out of the question. You had to stick your camera over sort of tripod, maybe get it on a jib, yeah. maybe get it on track and dolly, and that yeah, you were kind of dolly, yeah. you know, t- those were the shots you could get. The idea of um, like when Steady came in and Steady Cam came in in nineteen seventy five, um being able to move the camera like that was just a total absolutely fantastic it was a, yeah. it was a it completely changed the industry it was a yeah. revelation yeah um, and it, yeah so and, and that was the thing as well it was kind of would you have the budget to do something like what hitchcock would do where he would literally build like a whole stage and just have a crane be able to go mm-hmm. into like because there's, there's some scenes where he's like um i can't remember it might have been a shot in rebecca where he literally took like the roof off a house in a studio and like comes in with a crane and it's like mm. stuff like that like you just could you couldn't do that without like a just ridiculous budget obviously and um yeah. but yeah like literally being able to now like use stuff which is uh or if you had a steady cam which is a comp- you know it's quite a, quite an expensive piece of kit as well but having these more kind of um budget kind of stabilizer things but i would definitely look out though because they're um you want to make sure that you, you you know what you're getting before you get it as well. So yeah, we, I mean, you know, it takes a few minutes just to do, do a bit of a Google search and, and get getting some information on what you're thinking about buying. You know, yeah. it just take a few minutes, and you can probably say, "Oh, well, that's a I get like an average of four and a half stars that bit of kit, and there's a thousand reviews on there. Exactly, kind of know that it's going to be decent, and obviously avoid the ones that are like one or two star reviews. Exactly, and then so, they've made it out there, and you just gotta go and get it. Exactly, man. Uh, just to catch up quickly with the chat, Dan says, um, Dress to Kill is a classic too, really creepy. I haven't actually seen that one. Um, so, I haven't seen Dress to Kill now. Yeah. Yeah, you can check that one out. Hafen says that uh, Taxi Driver is pretty violent too, which is which is true. Uh, Paul Schrader always writes really dark scripts, um, very introspective, yeah. dark scripts. And, what's, uh, what's quite scary about Paul Schrader writing that is the fact that Paul Schrader kind of lived a lot of those things in his life. You know, yeah. It was, like, it was yeah. like living in his taxi. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. And that's what was kind of inspired by. I'm not sure how far yeah. it's inspired by, but it is to a degree inspired by his experiences of being on the streets. He he loves narration. I think he uses that in a lot of films, and he's always got really dark, uh, introverted yeah. characters. He is testament, I think, to the kind of thing that you 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 know. People have that kind of idea that a film needs to be all show, and it's true. But mm-hmm. if you look at a lot of kind of Paul Schrader films, ones he's directed or just wrote. There's a lot of narrative and it's very internalized. Like you, you yeah. really get, it's like they're always character studies and the more, um, there's more like novel-like qualities in them because it's mm-hmm. the characters in a monologue and stuff like that. And that's more kind of things you find with a lot of yeah. books, I think. You released a film last year, didn't you, with Ethan Hawke? So I haven't it, seen it. It looks good though. Yeah, first yeah I haven't seen that one, but it, 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 I think it won a load of awards. It did, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, need, I need to check that one out. Same. I, I, that, that's definitely on my list. Um, it, it looks good. And Ethan Hawke can, can put in a pretty good performance sometimes as well. Yeah, he's, he's a good actor. Hey, have you seen the Explorers? 
I haven't seen it. I need to check it out. Norman, you know, yeah. Smith, so that's a classic. Definitely. Kids film from the 1980s. I think like it's his first film. Yeah. Wow, really? That's awesome. Yeah. I'll check that. Check out Explorers, man. Yeah. I mean, I know people um, have mixed opinions about uh, Linklater, but the Sunrise trilogy as well. Like, I think that, you know, he's, he's, he's great in those. And, yeah. Um, well, yeah, Link, Link, Linklater is just kind of, he's a, he's a, He's like an indie director just doing some amazing stuff. Definitely. Those, those projects he works on, he's trying to push the boundaries. Totally. He's got some fantastic films. Yeah, like, yeah, like Boyhood. Like he shot Boyhood and you, he literally, he did like a milestone in filmmaking. And although it wasn't the greatest film, arguably, I would say that what he achieved is amazing. Like he shot Boyhood over the period of like 10 or 15 years with the yeah, same actors, time, which is yeah. unreal. So guys, if you've never seen that, that's, if you want like something, like a wild filmmaking experience where you've never seen anything like it, uh, check out Boyhood by Richard Linklater because it's literally yeah. like he shot with the same uh, cast and, and, and for like 10 years straight. And yeah, well, as, as they're getting older, yeah. you, you kind of believe it because they are getting older. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah, like, you know, this, you know, you know, this, this aging effect they put on yeah. actors face and trying to make them look younger. And, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I do uh, I do struggle with that. I saw a bit of them. Um, was it Gemini Man or Will Smith? Oh, I haven't seen it, but I can totally imagine yeah, that. Like, 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 you know, like a young guy again and... Yeah, you know, Scorsese's done this as well, I but think... I, I just, they, they just can't do it yet. It Correct. just takes out because it's, it's totally like a, does. It's like a I guess it's like a bit of a computer game. I know. Well, Goodbye. yeah, the Irishman had that as well, the CGI, right? But yeah, like, Irishman. yeah, I think that yeah, actors are moving like they're like seventy-five years old, but they're, 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 they're like, I know. They're it's still weird. Around, like old guys. <laughs> Scorsese is like a total legend, isn't he? I know, I know. But yeah, I think the, the the first hour of the Irishman was a bit of a struggle because of that, but then the last two hours, two and a half hours, were absolutely fantastic. Unreal. Yeah, the film completely I, works. Great, yeah. You can't see as much of the effects. It's a, it's a great film. Like I think, correct me if wrong. If I'm wrong, but I think that I don't know if Gemini Man was Ang Lee, maybe. Because um, if, if great, it is, great director. great director. Exactly, and it's it's, it's another case. Well, he, to be fair, credit to Ang Lee, he's done some really good Western films. Like I think that uh, Life of Pi was critically acclaimed, and a couple more. But uh, it's another example of like an um, Asian director coming to the West and not having as much of an impact or not being able to kind of have the same kind of films that they wanted to but then again with Ang Lee he's had like a lot of success in yeah Hollywood. he's uh, yeah he, he he's kind happened, of more of an exception yeah definitely just happens to have made this really bad film with, you know and they, they, they were trying to get Gemini Man made it for you look on Wikipedia they were trying to make it for like 20 years 25 years wow. with different directors different stars and they've eventually made it and Ang Lee signed on to be the director and it's it's his, it's his worst film it's his I know worst film. Make it, but what kind of went wrong he obviously yeah. knows how to make really great films. Definitely. Um, so what happens, you know, with Gemini Man to make it quite a compromised average film? Yeah, who it's, knows? It's always weird, isn't it? Because you never know. It's like, how, like, how much studio involvement was there? You know, was there? What was? The, it, there's all. It's all. It's like too many cooks. Sometimes it's hard to kind of tell what was the. Yeah, was the studio know. interference? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to think there was studio interference. Is that <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Dan says as well that Carlito's Way, we'll go back to the Palmer, obviously, is one of his favourite movies. And I would definitely say that actually it's one of mine. Um, there's something... Al Pacino performance. Oh, that is my God. Yeah. So good. It's one of his best. I think up with, like, Dog Day Afternoon, that's probably my favourite Pacino performance. Yeah, um, yeah. It's just unbe unbelievable. And I just love that kind of archetype of, like, an older character who's trying to, like, start afresh, but they keep getting, like... Pull me back in for like Godfather, Godfather, Godfather free Godfather. Code. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but that's it. And uh, it's just so good, man. And B Benny Blanco as well, obviously. Like, uh, you, you, you'll have seen Heat. Have you seen Heat? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like the Michael Mann film with um, classic. Like, like, there's no. Um, it's like an, an epic gangster film now, yeah. like a modern day gangster film. You know, that's it's you know some of the scenes and some of the acting in that is just like so good. It's a total. It's gonna be a complete classic heat, and it's a classic already. Yeah. In 30, 40 years time, people are gonna look back at it and be like, "Wow, we're making some great films yeah. tonight." What well, What's so weird but amazing about Heat is that you've got like um, Robert De Niro and Pacino's uh, stories so separately, and then there's that dinner scene where they're together, and it's their first like screen time together, and yeah. it's such like a, it's so amazing. Um, that was kind of, yeah, it was like a big deal, man. At the time, everyone yeah. was kind of waiting for these two like to yeah. kind of get together. Uh, and they eventually did, and it's like, and then the and then the film is a, a total classic five star film as well. I know like everything that we wanted, you know, we've got these two actors together, and an amazing like the man gangster film. And we couldn't have done any more, really. I know it's unbelievable, and um, I think as well, like uh, 
like it's like Leo and Brad, their first film together is in Hollywood, and it's like these guys have been like top of the food chain for so long, and they finally do a film together, and it's a Tarantino film, and it's like the chemistry is so good. It's like how have these guys never been yeah, in a film together? That's one of my favorite Tarantinos. It's yeah, dude. Really, yeah. Like, I, obviously, everyone's entitled to their own opinion. I totally respect that, but like, literally, it's probably my favorite Tarantino, right? And literally, like, some of my friends, like quite a few people I know, like didn't like it and i'm like how can you not like it's so good but like i could understand if you're not a tarantino fan and you didn't like it but if you're a tarantino fan and you didn't like it it's like what it's so good i think i think i think you've you've got to watch it where it it was supposed to be watched which is the cinema yeah totally i think if if you're gonna watch it at home you know and someone's knocking at your door and you know the kids are screaming upstairs and they're trying to watch this film you're not going to get it like you've got to just be in you know two and a half three hours in the cinema, you know, focused on the film, yeah. and then I think it really has resonance, and, and then it, you can get into the film. But if you've got too many distractions watching stuff at home, it's, it's not a classic film, is it? We but went to. It needs to be top three Tarantino films. Oh, 100%. We went to uh, Tyneside to see it as well, and I think it was supposed to be, um, I don't know if it was 70 mil or 35 mil, I can't remember, but it was a, it was a film projection of it, and yeah. uh, we were like, oh, yeah, we got to see it in film, it's going to be awesome. And the film projection wouldn't work, so they put the digital version on, and we didn't get our money back. And I was sat there like, "What? Really? They can't do this to us." It's like, yeah, yeah, seriously. I saw different experience. totally, man. I saw um, Punch Drunk Love, Paul Thomas Anderson's film. I saw that in um, in, in 35 mil in, in Tyneside, and that was awesome. And uh, you know, being able to see the film in actually projected in film, it's such a like an, a rich experience. I think it's, it's Adam Sandler, isn't it? Oh man, yeah, Adam yeah. Sandler's arguably best performance. Well, yeah, Uncut Gems yeah. is really good though if you haven't seen it. Yeah, what's your one hidden gems? Uncut yeah. Gems. It's Uncut Gems. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah, I saw that about six months ago. It's on Netflix, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's when people were thinking Adam Sandler was just kind of sold out, but then he occasionally he, he puts these performances in. Knocks it out of the park, man. Yeah, and um, um, oh, I can't, I can't, the Safety Brothers. That's who they are. They're good yeah. up, up and coming filmmakers that everyone should look out for. Because yeah, that's that, that film was like a. A really intense two hours. It's like a panic, panic attack, panic isn't it? It's, it's, <laughs> yeah. And obviously, you know what's going to happen at the end. And it's like, well, just don't do that. I know. Like, your life's in danger, man. Don't do it. They, yeah, yeah they, they are they like are so good at making um, like the the viewer anxious. I think they had a film called Good Time with um Robert Pattinson, which is really good as well. That's on Netflix as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've watched awesome. that one. Oh, it's, that one's good as well. And um, if there's questions about Rob Pattinson's act, acting ability, that's definitely one to kind of watch. Um, yeah. yeah. He's Batman, isn't he? I know, he's Batman. He's I can, Batman. Yeah. can imagine him as Bruce Wayne, but I don't know if I can imagine him as Batman. Like, uh, yeah. I, I, I love Bale. I thought Bale did a great job as Batman. Oh, that, yeah, those, those three Batman films. Yeah, those Christopher Nolan Batman films. Are fun. But yeah. Particularly the... The third one, not as much. It's good bits, but I think yeah. particularly the first two Batman films. Oh, yeah. So the good. So yeah, good, unreal. That one is so good, man. So I good. know it's 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 class, and I mean I, I love the Burton ones as well. Um, I, I thought uh, Michael Keaton's pretty good in those, but I feel like maybe the Nolan ones I prefer the most, probably. Yeah, I think I probably do as well. But you know what? Those films are inspired by Heat that we've already mentioned. Yeah. If you look, watch the, the bank heist in Heat, it's like it's like some of the um, heists going on in, in in Batman. It's like yeah. some of the because the criminal activity, you, you can you can totally see a parallel between those two films. Yeah, that, yeah, that, and that's really interesting because I think that not a lot of people would have draw that comparison with it being in a different universe. But yeah. then, you know, that that kind of makes me think about Joker, which came out like uh, semi recently, which is basically it's in Gotham City, but it's just New York. It, it's do you know what it is? It's like Taxi Driver um, with the Joker, basically. It's like yeah, it is, yeah, yeah. 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 That, that, that's what was was Scorsese was. I think he was on board like executive producer. I think he had to pull out maybe for the Irishman, but he yeah. was on board um, as part of the team. I think as a, I think it was an executive producer until quite late in you know, a stage of, of pre-production. Um, so yeah, it's you know it's, it's looking at the, the great films from the past and making a, a modern day contemporary film and being respectful of kind of what's gone before. And you saw yeah, it's what's the joke? It is like a homage. I think it's just a bit of a taxi driver homage, isn't it? Yeah. You watch yeah. it back to back and be see and, and see those similarities quite quite easily. Definitely, yeah. definitely, yeah. It's interesting. So, uh, the, the, the we've got a really, really active chat today, which is great. I think really people are really engaged with, with what we're talking about. Um, so that's really cool. And Hayfin was just saying that uh, Figgis is from Carlisle. Um, and then also he, he goes on to mention that Ridley Scott's from from Shields as well, which is one that people forget sometimes, but which is just mind blowing to me. And I, I watching I was watching him uh, on like a director's roundtable when he was doing The Martian, and it was just like I was like 
like this guy has like a proper Macam accent and he's like sat with like all of these like super famous I think Tarantino's on that round table as well and it's like it's just unreal to kind of see someone from Shields like I mean he's he's a legend you know and his and his, and his brother Tony who died yeah you know yeah, yeah. yeah from uh... northeast of England it's uh really yeah, Ridley Scott you know he's he's is he like 81, 82 now and he's yeah. still pumping out some great films yeah he's, man. he's got if you look at his back catalogue got like just you know a lot of absolute classic films in the last 40 years such a good director and i mean um you uh obviously mentioned a- alien right the first alien's really scott isn't it i'm not going it's crazy really scott, yeah that yeah. was the second film yeah yeah, yeah. wow and that's a, a, a hell of a film for a second film yeah. and then um you know one of my favorite films in the a really scott film also blade runner the original blade runner which is just yeah, Unreal. which was real which, which bombed when it came out i can't believe that you know <laughs> that's so crazy <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think was it was the version released? Was it the version with it with the commentary from? Um, yeah, so Ford. oh, because they made him. The, the, he was talking about being a cop. Yeah. In the city have you I seen? Think, have you seen? Panic- the, uh, what's it called? Have you seen the video where uh, Harrison Ford didn't want to do the narration at all, and he's reading the script and he's going, "This is ridiculous." He's like, he's reading the narration yeah. out and he's going, "This is so ridiculous." Like he didn't want to I do think, the I think narration. It's, I think it's because the the, the the actual studio thought the film was going to be so bad that they got scared and they tried to fix the film in some sort of way which made the film much worse yeah. and i think eventually when we got it was 10 15 years until we got to see a cut of it that was directors oh, right that's what the film is meant to be yeah. like it's meant to be about and it's and it's a really great film oh man yeah. it's so good and and uh vangelis's soundtrack is probably my favorite soundtrack on a film ever it's just oh, it sounds so atmospheric and like i was I, I, I watched bits of it semi-recently and i was watching i was thinking like this like considering they did I don't know if they did it with miniatures or how they did it, but like considering like it's like the eighties, it looks so realistic. Like it still oh, looks yeah. like oh, the future. Was, there, was, there was no yeah, there was no CGI then. Yeah, it was all well, a lot of it was like small models with yeah, little yeah. LED lights in to kind of get that cityscape. It looks yeah, unreal. Yeah. It's it's a fantastic, and I, I like the sequel as well. I think the Blade Runner sequel was a really good job. You know, actually, something as well that doesn't really get mentioned as well is that uh really scott's actually really good at drawing and uh some of the uh concept art that he did for blade runner is like really good like he did like some storyboards for it and they look mm-hmm. unreal like he actually is really good at drawing as well, well i think he, went, he, was, he was an advertising wasn't he i think he yeah. traveled from the northeast because he was he was a great artist and i think he joined an advertising firm studied art down there and that's you know people people enter the industry in different ways and like, that was his route that's how he kind of got in yeah uh, like and in, 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 um for me you know whenever i've been doing cinematography and stuff that the cinematography in blade runner was always something that inspired me so much like um the the, the scene um when he he meets uh what they call the re- rept 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 oh, replicant. yeah replicant when he meets the replicant for the first time and she sat down and she's smoking and it's like the lights just coming over a cigarette and it's like you can see the smoke like the, the yeah. lighting in that scene. And if you look in her eyes, it's been lit in a way that I think there was a light on top or just above the camera. Yeah. So she's looking and she's got this like metallic sort of looking at her. Yeah. Face. I don't know at that point that she's a robot. But yeah, the way it's lit, you can see there's so this like, otherworldly sort of artificial side to it. It's a, it's a hint of what's yeah. going to transpire that we're going to find out that she is a robot. It's fantastic. What did you think about the um the remake? The, 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 well, not the remake, but the sequel, sorry. 2049. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Again, another top director. Um, and I think it was, a, it was an absolutely solid sequel to, to Blade Runner, which we probably thought we could never really do. Um, but I think in the hands of, of, a, of a great director, um, yeah, it was brilliant. I loved it. I thought it was fantastic. Great, I great cinematography. Well. Fan, yeah. You know, Roger Deakins. Oh, man. Score. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, totally well done. And, and, and the thing is, we were saying at the time, it made money, but it didn't make like loads of profits. So yeah. A third one planned, which may or may not happen now because the second one didn't make as much money as what they thought. It's so good. <laughs> like uh, Denis Denis Villeneuve, I don't know if I said that right because one of the hardest names ever to pronounce. But uh, he Denis, Denis Villeneuve. Yeah, that's Denis Villeneuve. Villeneuve. Yeah, he he's great, and um, I think Roger Deakins. Yeah, I think Roger Deakins. Sorry, sorry, uh, Ian. He's making June at the moment, which is <sighs> say, it's an impossible book to. to uh, yeah, well, to that's the film that. Uh, John Arowski f- failed trying to make it. Um, David Lynch yeah. failed, so it's like it's like an impossible film, right? So yeah, I think it's coming out. Is it Christmas time? It's coming out, and yeah. it's probably get pushed back six months. But yeah, it's coming out in the not too distant future. 
I'm excited to, he, to try he's that. He's a great guy. Uh, I've seen Prisoners that he made. Yeah, I love it. Mario. So good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then he, yeah another, another director, I think, that I want to check out their back catalogue and see what they've done before because oh, he's great. I have only some fantastic films. Yeah. There. Yeah, he's awesome. Yeah, he is. He really is. And um, I think Deacons is probably, you know, a long time, you know, works with the Coen brothers. Uh, yeah. I think he's probably my favourite cinematographer. Um, if, if, you, if you listen to his podcast, Team oh, Dickens. What? I didn't even know that he had a podcast. That's yeah, awesome. Team, Team Dickens. And yeah. it's, it's him and his wife who works with him on these movies. Um, and they discuss different things about how they get into industry. Uh, they interview directors. Um, they talk about locations. They talk about you know how to practically light. So yeah, right. Team Dickens podcast is That's really awesome. Fun. I think yeah. that anyone who's in the chat as well who has an interest in cinematography, I think that's a hundred percent one to check out because yeah. obviously his insight is uh, is golden. I've just realised yeah. that we're you know we're uh, it five past five already because um j- just really enjoy talking to you and it's literally f- flew over mate. Um, you know I could talk about films all day literally it's like like uh, yeah, yeah. I, I well, it's, it's, quite, it's quite the pubs will open and we'll all go for a pint yeah. and talk about <laughs> let's let's do it man I'm totally down for that um so I'll just quickly. Catch up with what's been going on in the chat. I'm going to paste the survey into the link, and then I think that me and uh, Ian are going to go, guys. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'll just paste the link for the survey there. Make sure you please fill the survey in, guys. Just obviously, I know that if you're watching, you've probably by now done one. Obviously, it takes about 30 seconds to a minute, and it just helps us out a bit. So I'm just going to paste that into the chat there now. All right, cracking. Um, yeah, so let's just catch up with the chat, see what people are saying. So yeah, Dan says that uh, 2049 uh, is arguably the best looking film ever made. And I would definitely agree with that. Like I remember watching it in the cinema and just being completely blown away by it. Um, so <laughs> however, we all know the greatest movie of all time. This is from Dan. However, we all know the greatest movie of all time, dot, 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 don't we? And of a potential sackable offense if you get it wrong, Daniel. <laughs> it involves zombies somewhere along the I know. That, okay, so I'm going to say... <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and say that if it's like Dan, uh, I would say that it's it's Dawn of the Dead because I think that it's he, Dawn of the Dead. Yeah, he yeah. he, he loves it's, Dawn it's of without the Dead. Without a doubt, Dawn of the Dead. <laughs> there's no doubt about that. If, if, you just have, a look, if you have a look at his arms, it's yeah. all over. Hafen, <laughs> Hafen, that's a new one. Uh, Hafen said, uh, "Tag Dan," and he said, "Miss Congeniality too, armed and fabulous." <laughs> so it could be that one as well. I haven't missed that one. Is that a bit of a, a guilty pleasure for Hayfin, is it? <laughs> it's for Hayfin, I'm not quite sure there. It's uh, <laughs> hard, to, hard to tell. Um, so, yeah, as well, uh, Hayfin said that uh, uh, Tenet, um, Nolan's new film, possibly out this year, looks like a very typical, complex Nolan narrative. Everything's back. Yeah, to that's good. Yeah, they've, they've, they've pushed the release back. Um, the, the, the release date back. It was meant to be um, end of July. They've pushed it back two weeks to August. But I think they might push it back again. I think they want to make sure people are going to the cinema before they release the film to make Definitely. sure that they're making as much profit as they possibly can. But yeah, that's not... Did that was Bond, as well? yeah. they, Bond was literally going to come out. Like Bond was like days away from release and then they moved it back. So. Yeah, yeah this, it's just been so impactful all this lockdown, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Hopefully we're starting to kind of gradually come out of it. Just yeah, good. I know, yeah. I know. It's good stuff. Lynn, quick, Lynn said that uh, wasn't David Putnam the Chancellor of Sunderland Uni a million years ago? Um, well, yeah, he was. Yeah, and he's still involved with the university. He's got something called the Putnam Scholars, where every year six or seven students can um, can apply for this this scheme, and they work with Lord Putnam, and they make a short film over the course of a few months. So I think we've, this is the third year that we've been doing that. So yeah, so Lord Putnam's still involved in the university and still giving students great opportunities. You know, he's a total advocate of education and students, and, and and trying to you know give students opportunities to to get into industry. That's okay. absolutely brilliant. So it's good that you know. I like to be honest. Like um, Sunderland Uni is really good for for media. Um, they've got great cameras. You know, there's like um, when I was there, you know, you had a Black Magic a Cinecams. I'm sure that they've got better cameras now, even. But like that was that's still a great camera by today's standard. Um, Unreal lights, like great like Ari lights. Um, other than the equipment, obviously the tutors are great as well. So it's I, I would say that Sunderland Uni is like a really good place for for media. Yeah, in terms of the kit, we've, we've been really well funded over the over the years. Um, we do um, keep keep replenishing the equipment, and every summer we seem to get a few more bits and pieces of you know great cameras and lighting. So yeah, the, the gear was there for the students to use. That's awesome. And uh, yeah, so Sue was asked Anthony if uh, 
he would uh, another one of our lines if he was available for a voiceover and, and and they've agreed to sort a little voiceover out so that's that's pretty cool that they're going to be um collabing on something so um it's, yeah. it's, it's good to see that and uh lynn says it looks like hair from sack because that all about sandra b man um yeah sandra b is in uh speed two right she's also in speed one speed one is one of the best action films ever i think so um, yeah, yeah so good Keanu's yeah unreal, it's, great yeah, the, yeah. The, the, it's a very bad sequel but the, the original speed is a great film oh man it's so good and and one of the things about speed that not a lot of people know is that um uh joss whedon wrote most of the dialogue but he, um, because it was only dialogue, the studio argued that it doesn't change the plot or the narrative. So they mm-hmm. said that they couldn't give him a credit as a writer. So even though most of that dialogue's from him, they said that yeah. he couldn't, because he was working for the studio at the time, that he couldn't actually get a writing credit for it because it doesn't change the actual plot. So I thought it was yeah. pretty crazy. But I, but I presume he was paid lots of money though. Oh, absolutely. But it wasn't too bad. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd imagine. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I think that is about it. Thank you so much, uh, Ian, for joining us. Um, yeah, we had a really active chat and it was it was absolutely cra- uh, class crack on. So please make sure you get that survey done, guys. Um, we'll just f- for one moment, if there's any um, questions anyone's got for Ian just before we go, because we have run over a little bit. Um, just make sure you get them in now. But otherwise, um, please get that survey in. Hey from says Die Hard's the best uh, action movie ever made, best Christmas movie, and I would say yes, probably best best action movie as well. Um, and is there anything else there? I think, I think that's about it. And uh, Sue said as well, thank you, Ian. I'm very inspired now, so that's awesome. Brilliant. Yeah, it's been fun. All right, cracking. So I'm going to leave the yeah. advice screens on, and uh, me and Ian are going to go now. Um, I'm going to leave those on just for a couple of minutes, guys. But thank you so much. I appreciate it, and uh, I'll see you guys uh, on Monday probably. Yes. Cheers, right. guys. Cheers, guys. Bye-bye.